Mick Keith Tracy is with us. Keith, good morning to you. How are you? I'm very well, lad. How are you? Um, before we get into Rovers and the disappointment of uh, them crashing out last night, we did just we were just talking about the Deli Alley interview and one of the, the big takeaways and has kind of been spoken a good bit about it since is the use of sleeping tablets in football. And I definitely remember talking to John Giles about how he couldn't sleep after games. It'd be like two, three, four o'clock in the morning. The adrenaline was still pumping through his body. And so you'd kind of have the blues the next day from it now that's the late 50s 60s and 70s nowadays if you can't sleep what happens you get sleeping tablets but uh, now the, the big the big one for me I, I generally wouldn't take them after games I, I was out getting drunk so I didn't need sleeping tablets but before games on a Friday night in a hotel you just knock on the the doctor's door or the doctor would come down to dinner with you and they'd just be handed out right so it would be no great deal you just say I'm struggling to sleep there you go, two sleeping tablets, no problem. And do you not wake up feeling a bit groggy and therefore not not at your very best as a footballer the next day? No, not really. The trade-off is you feel, if, you, if you're if you not going to sleep, you're not going to play well. If you sleep, at least you've got some chance of playing well. Yeah, sometimes for, for players, you just get into this rhythm of you take a sleeping tablet, you go to sleep, you wake up, you have your coffee, you go to the game and it just becomes a routine. So, yeah, sometimes, I, I never felt groggy, I always felt good and, you know, like I say, Footballers are very, uh, very superstitious with this stuff. So you have one good game after having a sleeping tablet on a Friday. You do it the next Friday and the next Friday, and before you know it, you're quickly into a habit, and it's not a good thing. But towards the end, I, I, I came away from football in England about I think it was 2013 and 14, and the doctors were starting to clamp down on it. They weren't handing them out quite as readily, but you were getting them. You just had to be a little bit more persistent with your complaining. But they were clamping down on it. But it's still very very persistent because I don't know if, uh, if people haven't seen the Boris Becker documentary after his incredible early success there's this period where he's not great and he's a complete playboy and having the crack um, but he's addicted to sleeping pills in, in, at, at one stage in it as well and has to come off them and it's really difficult for him and when you stop taking them it, was it easy or was it straightforward or was like could you it, well, I just got through it it was you know when I came back and uh even playing for Barnsley towards the end when I was playing when I was staying in hotels I, I wouldn't be getting sleeping tablets and I'd just be sitting there staring at the ceiling most of the night and you'd wake up and wouldn't feel great yeah. and you're just in a bit of a, a groggy mood and you're thinking I didn't sleep well you don't play well and you, you sort of have to you get in this rut and you sort of have to kickstart yourself out of it and just you know cop on a little bit but uh, yeah it does It you do get into that habit of just taking them and before you know it it's, it becomes the norm and you know you it's not easy, but yeah, I think a lot of players are probably struggling with stuff like that, and it's just the, the wonderful, weird world of football. Was it more prevalent, Keith, at more clubs than others? Like I was chatting to a, a former professional fo- Premier League footballer quite recently, and he was saying it was everywhere. Like mm. every footballer he knew was on sleeping tablets. Everywhere, himself. like literally, you, you go down for dinner at seven o'clock uh, at night in the hotel on a Friday night, and the doctor would just be there, and he'd be literally going, and he'd just be popping them out, and people would just have their hands out, would be going over but lads' shoulders. It was literally. The exception, you might get one or two that know I'm okay, but generally, most of the squads I was in, everybody was popping sleeping tablets at night. And here's the thing, right? Uh, if they work for you and you're not getting addicted to them, that's fine. But if that's the only way you can sleep in advance of big occasions, then it becomes slightly problematic. Yeah, well, this is what I'm saying. Towards the end... Did you get told? So you, uh, uh, Towards the end, they started to say, by the way, this could be a problem, but here you go? Yeah, well, I, I think... A lot of people like there was at the start when I when I broke into four teams there was maybe one or two lads that would take sleeping tablets. Right. Then you know two or three years in it would be the majority of the squad. And then I think the doctors and the managers were starting to cop on that ninety percent of the squad are taking sleep tablets on a Friday night. And yeah, it, it they did start to clamp down on it. But then like I've had ones where the doctor would say to the manager, "Okay, I won't be handing out them." But then you'd walk in the corridor and he'd give you two and you'd go okay. to sleep. So yeah. it'd be behind managers' backs as well. Could yeah. you could you sleep without them in advance of a match? I could, I, I could sleep, but like I said, there'd be an awful lot of lying there, you know, staring at the ceiling, scrolling through my phone. Yeah. And eventually, I would get to sleep, but it, it wouldn't be as as quickly. You know, it, maybe it does a bit of a placebo effect in it all. But yeah, if I pop the sleeping tablet by half ten, I'm generally in bed, tucked up and sleeping. Right. Uh, okay. Really interesting stuff. Let's get on to Rovers last night, which was less interesting, but um, it's a big setback for the league. Like. Um, we can talk about Rovers specifically, but uh, we really need our teams performing well in Europe. And just at the moment, for whatever reason, we're not performing well in Europe. Yeah, well, look, I, Rovers are in in the game last night, I think they did okay. I think Breda Blick are an awful lot better than people give them credit for. I think on the face of it, people thought an Icelandic team 
won't be that good. When and, and in fairness, now Iceland are a, a decent international team. I get it with the Faroes, I get it with Gibraltar, I get it with Luxembourg. People half dismissing them teams, but Iceland, Breedablick, very very good team. And the first forty five minutes in Tallaght is what killed Rovers. They didn't turn up in the first forty five minutes. Uh, the second goal for Breedablick, I think your man tries to cross it. It just ends up in the back of the net. I think they're, they're quite lucky with that. And uh, look, Rovers away form in in, uh, in Europe hasn't been good but the way like when when Rovers get the goal away Sean Hoare is playing the left of a back three and he's in midfield trying to press the ball you think like, even what's the point just defend the space keep it tight keep it narrow in the last quarter of the game then you go and try and get something because it's, it's only a one goal deficit when they hit the back of the net I thought right it's really really hard now it's become nearly impossible and they gave up three chances in a row Rovers it wasn't like they were dominating the game and Breda Blick went bang and he went oh it was like within 10 minutes they had three chances and a very good team would have hit the back three would have hit the back of the net three times Breda Blick managed to do it once and then they did it twice and it was just I, I don't want to say the, the setup from Rovers was naive because that's how Rovers play that's how they play in this league but I think they should have played a little bit deeper Suffer the don't give any space in behind, make it really difficult, and try and get try and get towel and uh, towel and Bork an awful lot closer to Gaffney, which they did do, but they were leaving too much space in behind. They were on the halfway line at times, which for me is a little bit naive in hindsight. Rovers did have significant injuries. I think mm. both first choice wing backs um, and obviously Jack Byrne are out. And like, you know, although they have a much bigger squad than everybody else and a much deeper squad than everybody else in the League of Ireland, they probably can't afford to have the pace of the players that were missing on the wings and also just Jack Byrne's experience and creativity. Yeah, well, look, I, I get that. Jack Bourne, a, a big, big miss. Farouge, a big, big, big miss as well. Uh, but Graham Bork, uh, he came on and in the second half of the first leg looked really good for 10 minutes looked like he could make something happen played the majority of the game last night scored a penalty but you could see when he when he got taken off he, he was screaming in anger he wasn't happy he was effing and jeffing and that, I think that was the frustration in his performance that he didn't really play well and you know although there was a lot of endeavour they ran around they tried but in terms of personal performances I don't think any of the Rovers players are walking away thinking I played well today you know it was, it was they tried like I say it, it's hard to be critical of players when they are trying and they're running around but I just think standing on the halfway line you know 20 minutes into the first half getting balls clipped down the side you, it's inviting pressure and I think Rovers just did it too many times Roberto Lopez beaten for pace for the mm. first Breedablick goal like his performances lately have been I guess not what you expect of, of Pico like in years gone by he's been maybe struggling a, a bit lately yeah, look, I, I like I like Kiko Lopez, I like Sean Hoare and Dan Cleary. I think they're three really, really good centre halves. But when you have them three lads standing on the halfway line, they, look, they are quick, but there's quicker players out there for them. And if if I seen them three standing on the halfway line as a centre midfielder, I'm thinking this is going to be a decent day for me because I have all the space in the world down the channels to hit them. I can go down the side of Lopez, and I just thought the back three were exposed. And I, I don't think there's an awful lot of pace in the back three. That's why I, I think it's nonsensical to be standing on the halfway line. You can do it in the league of Ireland but when you go to in, into these European games you have to show Breed a bit a little bit of respect stand off a little bit let them frustrate them you know let them try and keep the ball but frustrate them and try and try and play for moments in the game and then towards the end you start throwing big punches but they were out of the game before they even got a, a foothold in it Is their recruitment wrong for Europe? Is it okay for Ireland for the League of Ireland but not good enough for European football? <sighs> No, I, I wouldn't say that. I just don't think... Look, I, I think obviously Breed Blick are better than people give them credit for. I think that's, that's the underlying thing here. But I, I just I think a lot of them didn't turn up. Graham Bork is... Oh, sorry, Jack uh, Jack Bourne's a big, big mix. Graham Bork didn't play particularly well. Ferruja would be a, a, a big impact on this team as well. And I think maybe tactically... It's, like I say it's very very hard to be, be critical of Stephen Bradley and this Shamrock Rovers team but I think in hindsight if he could have it back maybe play a little bit deeper a mid to low block and really suffocate that space in behind because they're very agile up front uh, the the point about not having the pace in the back three mm. have they recruited pace in the team anyway the, like 
Yeah, well, I, Are they I, a bit I, short of pace at, at this level? I think all over the pitch, I think they're short of pace. I think, that obviously, Cavan is not... Th- there's a lot of players there that are not slow, but you're thinking, Graham Bourke, good player, but he's more of a ball manipulator, doesn't run away from people. Jack Bourne, the same ball manipulator, doesn't run away from people, can open people up, but he's passing. Rory Gaffney, at times, he's getting the ball into his chest, he will run down the channels, but again, doesn't exactly run away from people. And when Gaffney comes to the ball, you need people threatening him behind to, to get the press a little bit looser. And look, there was moments in the game Rory Gaffney had a snapshot that went really close the, the goalkeeper made a decent save but like I say the the game last night was, was quite quite a decent tempo they were playing forward early Rovers in the first 10 minutes they looked decent I thought with, uh, with Bork and Tell and Pilm all committing to the press I thought this is really brave but then when you go and lose 2-1 it becomes into the realm and uh, naive again. The lack of goals has to be a concern, doesn't it? Like that penalty last night's the first goal in, in what four matches for yeah. Rovers. That that's that's a power return for a team that's supposedly the best in the country. Yeah, and it's like I think they had sixty percent of the ball in the first half and sixty percent of the ball in the second half. So they had the the lion share of possession in both halves and just just failing to be to be really productive with it. And they got shots off, but you know I'm not sitting here saying oh that chance they should have scored, that chance they should have scored. I think the Sean Hall one where he takes a touch in the box, his first touch is good, but just two or three breather play players in front of him, he would have done very well to squeeze that past anybody. They had one or two chances where he huffed and puffed, but yeah, the, the quality a chance that, that Rovers are making at the minute is not up to the standard that you would think and like you say in this league they'll get away with that they'll hit the back of the net they'll right. make better chances but because that was I think Stuart Burns point that they're not being driven to mm. excellence they're being driven to grand and that's enough to win the League of Ireland but it's not it's not inspiring them to go above and beyond to reach a point where uh, they're doing stuff that they've never done before and they're creating their own sense of history in European football. Is that is that not taken into context the fact that the rest of Europe is actually light years ahead of... So Iceland, for example, you, you make the point about um, their international side. They obviously beat England in the Euros when Roy Hodgson was the manager and then there was like all this kind of, how the hell did this happen? They invest loads of money in facilities. Yeah. They have loads of indoor training facilities that uh, their tiny population uses during the winter and the contact hours with the players is mm. higher than our contact hours and so therefore, you know, uh, they're coming off a higher base and we shouldn't ignore that. But at the same time, Stuart's point was essentially there's no great rival pushing them and putting them to the pin of their collar to the point where they're in games like this and they're thinking their way through it or they're coming up with something different yeah look I, I get that but I, I would I would be putting the mirror up to the lads and thinking right you can win the league at a canter you aren't really at full tilt to win the league but you just need to look at yourselves and de- like I know I played for St. Pat's when we were in Europe and as soon as you go into the dressing room the first game of pre-season you start talking about the European game so there's, there's no lack of motivation here for the Rovers players there really isn't so to be saying oh, well they're having an off week in, in the league here and there and that hasn't been great this has been coming this has been coming in the pipeline they knew it was coming I expected them to raise the levels they did and look on paper with Rovers league form you could probably think this is no surprise for them to lose to Breda Blit because they haven't been great in the league and I know there's people screaming they're top of the league they're winning at Akanta but their performances individually their standards that they can reach they haven't quite reached and yeah maybe like it, it took me years to find out as a professional footballer you can't just turn it on like a tap it doesn't just turn on it needs to be an every, every time thing so if Rovers aren't getting the consistency in the league it's only uh, it's only logical to think that they're, they're not going to hit the, the levels in Europe and they haven't but look oh yeah I, I think they just need to look at themselves and be, be more driven by themselves and think like I want to play well in Europe I want to put myself in the shop window and, and not worry about how the league is now uh, Neil Smith says tactically so conservative by Bradley over both legs they had nothing to unlock Breda Blick Kenny is really lively and he allows Gaffney to peel off and make runs pity he didn't start last night so uh, um, what does he mean by conservative because I thought he was really aggressive in his press and playing high forward tempo like the amount of numbers he was pre- like he only left O'Neill in the centre uh, the centre mid position Bo- uh, Tell, Poon, Bork, Finn, Cavanagh were all committing to the press so to say it was conservative I don't know about that I'd have probably liked to see him play a little bit more conservative and drop back a little bit and squeeze and make it really horrible and play for moments in the game but that's not the Rovers way I get that Okay, so you don't think he's that tactically conservative generally then? No, I, I think he's quite expansive and open with, with how he tries to play football, Stephen Bradley. I think it, it's lovely on the eye, but when you're coming in and you're losing 2-1, I don't think that really matters. I think there, w- there was an avenue for, for Rovers to win that game last night, but I think it was more more of a grinding win than a, an open, expansive win. What about the point about starting Johnny Kenny in these games? Like You know, you brought him in on loan from Celtic and... Um, 
he does seem like he is a slightly different player from the other players they have yeah well I, I don't think he can play Kenny up by himself just because he's so young I think he'd get lost up there I think even Gaffney at times was, was isolated in the first leg so if you play Kenny up there you have to play Gaffney with him and then that means maybe Bork is coming out of the team and I was delighted that Bork did play again in hindsight he didn't play well maybe you, you could have played Kenny but I thought starting with Bork was a, was a good shout but didn't quite play well and look Towell and Bork did get close to Gaffney so he wasn't as isolated and look I, I do like Kenny I think spinning into the channels I think he's really really agile he is quick and he's a decent finisher but you know you can't just throw lads into these European games okay. that haven't played before so I wouldn't say I, I'd like to see him, see him play but Gaffney was always going to start Tom McDonald writes in the Irish Independent today Keith as well talking about the, the Rovers legacy and on whether it adds an asterisk their, their lack of form in Europe um, like for a team to have a proper legacy especially League of Ireland team do you, do you need to have a, a European pedigree as well as the, all the titles domestically? Uh, I think it helps it definitely helps for the, for the legacy but I don't think it's the be all and end all I think they've been, been very very good in the league over the last couple of years they've dominated you know pretty much been untouchable and it's been like that for a long a long time in the league so we shouldn't dismiss that but again yeah I think they need some sort of European run some sort of thing to get us on the edge of our seats get into the group stages even if it is the, the conference league this year if they can get into the group stages of that then I think that would be a success but it's not going to be easy it's not going to be easy it's a long L slog from here to get to the group stages three games in six weeks is it yeah yeah. yeah. now they look they've got the squad and oh, maybe the injuries start to clear up I don't know what the what the profile of um, Farouja and, and Jack Burns injuries are but um, this is going to be a sobering moment for them it's going to have to be some hard conversations had right yeah, look, I, I would have thought so, but again, I, I wouldn't overreact to this. So I, I, I do think the League of Ireland is in a decent place. I do think it's getting stronger all the time. I know Rovers getting beat by Breda Blick is probably a shock, but look, give Breda Blick a bit of respect. They're a decent, decent team. Every one of their players seemed comfortable on the ball. They were all athletic. They pressed well, very well drilled, very rigid, didn't give up an awful lot of chances. So I would give a little bit of credit to Breda Blick rather than pressing the panic button on the League of Ireland. The concern is they play, so they find out this evening who they play in the Europa Conference League qualifiers. So it's Klaxvik from the Faroe Islands or Ferenc Faras. Uh, probably have more European pedigree I guess mm. um, but that was that was scoreless in the Faroes and you'd imagine French Faroes will have enough to, to win that game tonight but all of a sudden you're going into a game against a team from the Faroe Islands who have had a pretty decent result in Europe you know drawn with, with a team like French Faroes so like as you yeah. say like so then I play the winners no? they play the losers of that tie the right. defeated team so like which could well be the Faroe team but if you lose to them then all of a sudden there's question marks over yeah. the league over the league yeah again but uh, I think that's a very broad comparison people saying oh, the League of Ireland up against a, a, a fair Ireland team we should beat them I don't think it's as black and white as that I think there is some there is some decent gems in this league and look uh, in the in the European competition so look I, I, I don't think you can throw a blanket and say we should beat every fair team there is out there there is some decent teams so look we'll wait and see what they like and see who they get but I do expect Rovers now to go on a little bit of a run whether they get to the actual league stages or not remains to be seen but I think they should win at least a, you know, a couple of games What about Pats against uh, Dudelang they looked like things were going pear-shaped for them but they got themselves back into the game yeah, they did. They were they were dominated really from uh, from start to finish. They were poor in possession, lost the ball. Uh, they were very very sloppy at times. And when uh, when Dudelange went two 0 up, you thought this is really really poor. And I thought uh, the game. I heard somebody summing the game up saying it was a, a really poor performance, but a decent result for St. Pat's. And that's probably the best way you can put it. That they were dominated for ninety minutes, managed to nick a goal and a one goal deficit going into Inchicore on Thursday is not the worst not the worst uh, thing in the world. So Inchicore will be bouncing on. Course, you know, I'm doing uh, the the commentary for that, so I'm really looking forward to it and very, very hopeful that Pats can do something. But Chris Forrester, Jake Mulraney, Connor Carty, all these lads that have been really torn up in the league will have to turn up. Big players will have to turn up on the night. And like I say, very, very hopeful. But Dula Lange again are probably a little bit better than people get them credit for. Yeah, uh, uh, Pats have a relatively young team as mm. well, so like there is a possibility for these games to have a massive impact if they were to win one and to get on a bit of a roll and suddenly understand what's possible. Yeah, well, the likes of Sam Cordes, Mason Millier, uh, there's, there's one or two others as well in the squad. Young Reese Bartley might even make the squad. So, yeah, look, it's it's really, really good for them. It's 
these are the times where as you're young you start to think this is the norm playing in Europe I wanted to be like this all the time so this will drive them on to want to be finishing in the top four every year with St. Pat's and wanting European competition so yeah success just breeds more success and it, it's great to see that that average age of the Pat's team is so low and the pathway from the academy to the force it's team it's the there. opposite uh, Dan and Johnny were making the point the uh, average age of the Rovers team is very high mm. and that's a, a team built to win the League of Ireland but that actually they need an infusion of youth yeah, yeah, possibly. But look, if if I had that Rovers team on paper, you would think I, I'd be fairly happy. But there's some outstanding talents in there. And look, I I, I still think Graham Bork, he, he's his goal return in the league has been quite good. But I still think there's a little bit more to come from him. And like I said, Ferrugia and Jack Bourne coming in will be a, make a big, big difference to that Shamrock All Rovers right. team. Keith, good stuff. Thanks, William. Cheers.